Hey, RCC family, my name is Sam, and I'm one of the pastors here at RCC, and it is so good to see you here online. If you're watching live with us on Facebook right now, make sure you say hello. Uh, Feel free to engage in the comments and mention anything that you find interesting or answer some of the questions that might be asked during this time. Uh, That'll be some fun for you. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, maybe it's Sunday, maybe it's Tuesday, maybe it's Thursday night, who knows? Maybe it's Friday night, and you are just choosing to spend some time watching a sermon on Friday night. You rock, and I hope you're enjoying it tonight. I hope you're having a fantastic fantastic Friday night. Anyways, whatever time you're watching this, I am so excited that you're jumping in on here and listening because we are in this series called Doubt. Pastor Adam kicked it off last weekend and he did a fantastic job. And if you haven't seen that yet, you got to make sure you jump on and listen to that uh, because he did a really great job talking about how we can doubt God's power in our lives. And I think it was really tremendous. You should definitely check that out. We're in this doubt series, though, because doubt is this crazy thing, this thing that we've wrestled with, we've struggled with, maybe. And in fact, doubt is actually this fantastic thing, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, because it can actually do these these awesome things to, to be a crucial part of your faith. Doubt is this way to actually engage in the things that help your faith grow and be magnified and, and grown. Um, doubt is this thing that I think we're often scared of, but we shouldn't be because it can actually be this thing that leads us to grow our faith and have a more sturdy and solid and lasting faith. I used to be the youth pastor here at RCC, and when that was the case, I was always really worried or nervous or uh, maybe a bit fearful that the, the students would hear all this information and good things about God. They'd understand God in a certain way, and then they'd go off to school and when they got to school, maybe they'd hear some ideas and those ideas would cause doubts and then they would lose their faith. Because of that, I wanted to give these students the best understanding of God that I possibly could. And so once in a while, I would talk about God and God being like a box, right? Um, now, obviously, God's not a box, especially not an Amazon box. But if God were a box, and this is kind of how we understand him, uh, sometimes we have these ideas about God. And we take these ideas and we just place them in our box about God. And over time, we begin to have this nice little box filled with who we think God is. This is God for us. And it's an interesting thing because we'll start to like get really attached to this box and who God is and who we think God is. But then, all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere sometimes, there'll be this idea or this question or this, maybe we'll call it a doubt. And it creeps in, and we try to fit it in the box, but it, it doesn't want to fit in the box. And so I would talk to my students about this, and, and I would tell them that there's two ways you can go at it when you have this question or this doubt that doesn't fit in your God box. The number one way you could deal with it is you can stuff it down. And you say, you know what, doubt, you're just not going to be real. I'm not going to worry about you. I'm not going to think about you. I'm going to stuff it down inside, and we're going to hold on really delicately to my box and try not to drop it hoping it doesn't smash. Or you can take this doubt and you can realize it doesn't fit in this box and we can realize that we made this box. This isn't necessarily God, it's just who we think God is and we can take this box and we can destroy it, throw it out, get rid of it because that's not who God is. That's just who we thought God was. And when we take this doubt, this thing that forces us to ask questions about who God is and what God is like, and if it didn't fit in our box, we can now have a better, more full, more complete understanding of who God is based on who God really is because we've engaged this doubt. And that is why this series is so important because it helps us engage with God on the things that matter most and understanding God to a more full and f- uh, a more full degree more and more and more throughout our life. We'll never completely understand him, but we'll get to have the best, most full view of God that we possibly can if we engage our doubts. Now, as we engage this doubt today, uh, we are in for a doozy. We are asking a really hard doubt question. We are asking the question, is God really a Packer fan? Now, I know there's a lot of reasons why God might be a Packer fan. We've got some good things going for us. Number one, we've got the fact that we've got some Super Bowls, and that's a positive thing. You'd think that'd be a reason God is a Packer fan. Additionally, we've got like quarterbacks through the years that have just been like untouchable. They're they're amazing, amazing quarterbacks throughout the years. Uh, Lastly, the literal trophy is named after a Green Bay coach for the Super Bowl. How could God not be a Packer fan if, if that's the case? 
Now, I know what you're going to say. There's this weird thing. Some teams have the audacity to say, you know what? God is really a Vikings fan, and I think they're crazy. And maybe even crazier still, some people say that God's a, a Bears fan, and I think they're nuts. But craziest of all, some people even think, can possibly believe that God's a Patriots fan, like the dirtiest team in all of football. They can think that God's a Patriots fan. I think you're nuts. Now, I know this is kind of fun to, to think about, and I'd love to spend the rest of our time together today just laying out all the reasons God's a Packers fan and not anybody else, but that's actually not our topic for today. Our topic for today, uh, it, this actually helps us get there. Our topic for today is this. Is God really on my side? Is God really on my side? You've uh, probably heard one of those verses before that people sometimes quote when they, when they think God is, is helping them out. Uh, it's Romans 8.31, and it says this. It says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Paul, who wrote Romans, is talking a little bit about amazing things that Jesus, he just explained Jesus has done. Now, as he finishes that, he says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? He says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Maybe you've heard these verses before, these words before, and you thought, that's awesome. If God is for me, then who can be against me? We hear that, and we think, that sounds awesome. I mean, why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you want to believe and know that God is for you? I mean, there's some good stuff in there. There's some good stuff to think about. I mean, even if you begin to look at what Jesus says and when God is for you and, and what happens when that's the case, There's actual, literal power given to you when God is for you. Jesus says this, it's Acts 1.8. It's some of the last things that Jesus says. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. Man, who doesn't, wanna, who doesn't want to receive power from God? It sounds great. Who doesn't want to have God's power on your side? Now, if you read through the book of Acts a little bit farther along, this power thing actually plays out in some interesting ways. There's this one time where uh, Philip, the um, guy that was out speaking about Jesus, he went to Samaria, the region of Samaria, and was speaking about Jesus and telling these people about how amazing Jesus' gift to us is. And people were gathering around. Philip was performing miracles in Jesus' name, and there were just some incredible things happening. And because of this, so many people were believing in Jesus. In this region where Philip was, uh, there's a man named Simon. He was uh, believed to be a sorcerer. Uh, so he, he had power, they thought. He was a, the powerful one or the, the God-filled one, they would, they would call him. And because of this, people would go to Simon to get information. They'd go to him to get wisdom or hear from him, whatever he would say. He was renowned in the region. Now, when Philip came, you can imagine what Simon was thinking. Here, this guy is stealing my thunder. How am I going to deal with this? But to Simon's credit, he goes and he actually listens to Philip speak and hears about this Jesus guy. And he believes. Like, he believes in Jesus and he's baptized. It's incredible. Even the most powerful man in the town decides to believe in Jesus. Word spreads that there's this amazing thing happening in Samaria where Philip is. And so the apostles, they send Peter and John to go and check it out. Peter and John, they come and they check it out and they begin to, to see what's happening. And they found out, find out that people have been baptized in the name of Jesus, but not the Holy Spirit. And so they begin to pray for people and put their hands on them so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. Simon sees this and he is amazed. Check out what it says in Acts. It says this. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, May your money be destroyed with you, for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and held captive by sin. Man, 
to be Simon in that moment. I mean, what gives, right? But Simon, to his credit again, he, he realizes what he had done wrong. And, and immediately he exclaims to, to Peter, pray that this terrible thing doesn't happen to me. He humbles himself right away. But what's going on here? Like, what's the big deal? What did Simon do that was so bad? Why, why is this such an issue? He, he just wanted the ability to share this Holy Spirit, this amazing power with other people. He just wanted to be able to give it to other people. What's the big deal about that? Why, why is such a big stink about that from Peter? I mean, what, what's so bad about it? Wasn't God on his side in the first place? Wasn't God on his side? Without quite realizing it, Simon wasn't saying, I want God on my side. He was saying, I want God's power on my side, and I'm willing to pay for it. And why wouldn't you, right? Like, I I get it. I get where he's coming from. You see God's power. You see these men do these amazing things in the name of Jesus, and and you can't help but want to have that kind of power. It's it's intoxicating. (laughs) I think back to when I was a little kid, I grew up on a, on a farm north of Ripon here, and our farm sat kind of on this hill. The house that we lived in was, was on the hill. It still is there. Um, and growing up, I remember uh, off to the west was this valley, and so you could look out our uh, dining room window, and you could see the, the weather kind of stretch out across the horizon uh, to the west. And we also had this thing called a DTN, which showed us like the weather and the crop prices and stuff. This is like the time of dial up and stuff. So this is way before you just search something in Google. But I remember thinking to myself like, that, this is amazing. I can go downstairs. I can look at the weather and see how it is on the map. And then I can go outside and I can see it form on the skyline. I thought it was incredible. And there were times when like a torrential rain was coming. And, and I remember thinking to myself, I, I got to get rid of this. And I don't want the rain to come. I want to play outside and stuff. And so I would pray that the rain wouldn't come. And there would be times that like it would split around us. And I'd be like, man, that, that's awesome. Maybe that prayer worked. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, but that would happen, and later I realized that it's like a lake effect pretty often from where that is, and like Lake Winnebago or whatever, like things just split right around us because of that science geeky stuff, weather geeky stuff, I guess. But also one time there was this situation where there was a tornado warning, and literally we sat out on our front lawn and looked out on the horizon. We could see the tornado cloud kind of heading north uh, just to the west of us. And I remember praying that that wouldn't hit us, and I remember being so grateful that it happened. And I also remember feeling a little powerful, like, I want to control God. That's a weird feeling. It's not good in the long run, but in that moment, I can empathize. I can think, like, man, it would be amazing to control God, just have whatever I want. These are real things that we do. Why wouldn't we want God's power? Why wouldn't we want to be able to command it? Except God's not a genie. God's not a genie that we can buy with money, especially. God is not Blue Will Smith up in the sky where we get three wishes. That's just not who God is. That's not how God works. But honestly, sometimes I wish it was how it worked. I wish it was the way that things worked because as, as a pastor, sometimes I get to hear uh, some of the hardest parts of people's lives. And I hear about someone losing their job and I think to myself, God, like, where are you? This person works hard. There's no reason that they should lose their job. What, what's going on? Where, where'd you go, God. Or I hear about a person getting a, a bad diagnosis. They, they go to the doctor and, and it comes out the, the way you don't want it to come out. And, and you think to yourself, this person doesn't deserve this, God. God, what gives? Why, why the bad diagnosis? Why, why can't you fix this, God? Heal them. Or we hear about marriages struggling or falling apart or relationships struggling and, and you can't help but be frustrated. Like, God, why, why aren't you working in their lives? Why, why can't you make this better for them? I can see them hurting so much. Or, or maybe someone loses somebody or there's a fire or, or whatever else. There are so many things that we see going wrong 
And sometimes we just wish we could say, God, what's the deal? What gives? Sometimes we want to scream up in God and say, God, I thought you were on my side. I thought you were for me. Aren't you for me? What gives? We can laugh about whether or not God is a Green Bay Packers fan or not. But when it gets to this kind of stuff, it gets really real really fast. We don't laugh about these things quite so easily. And it causes us so much doubt. Isn't God on my side? Isn't God for me? Because if God is for us, then who can be against us? Right? But here's the thing. When we read that verse, that uh, verse in Romans 8, 31, that talks about God being for us and who can be against us, we're really quick to jump on that. So quick that we sometimes forget to ask the most important question. We forget to ask the question, how? How is God for us exactly? How is he for us? And the amazing thing about this is that Paul answers it. He is writing this letter in in Romans, and he literally, in these next verses, shows us how God is for us, and it is crystal clear. Take a look. Through the verse, um, Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these, Jesus? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? And then he goes on to demonstrate exactly how God is for us. He says, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is how God is for us. God is absolutely for us. God is for us experiencing a relationship with him. God is for us experiencing his grace and forgiveness. God is for us experiencing a life with meaning and purpose so far beyond different possessions or money or things or a certain perfectly packaged life that seems like that will make us happy enough. God is for so much more than any of those things. God is for us to have a meaningful, purposeful life that is part of what he wants us to do that gives us purpose and meaning. So, is God on our side? It depends, I guess, doesn't it? It depends. If God is for the things that we're for, that's what it depends on. Is God for me buying a brand new house? Well, it depends on like a whole bunch of things. All kinds of factors would go into that decision. Is God for me uh, eating this amazing burger that I experienced this last weekend? Uh, this last weekend, we, we ordered from Tin Roof, which is a brand new restaurant down in, uh, down in downtown Ripon, and it's amazing. Like, we ordered this thing, I, I ate this burger, and I think it was life-changing. So is God for me eating this burger? I really hope so. I don't know if he really cares in the long run, but I really hope he's for me doing that. Is God for me treating my family poorly? Of course not. 
God's for me treating my family really well. Is God for me loving my neighbor, my friends, my enemies? Yes, it's right out of scripture. God is for me doing those things. God is for us knowing and having a relationship with him. God is for the things we do when we do the things we do for him and in worship of him. God is not on our team. We have to make the decision whether or not we are on God's team. We want God to be the one who's steering the ship, not us. We want, we want God leading not our whims this way or that way. We want God to be the, the, the one that's pointing us forward in the direction we should be going. There's this other time in, in the book of Acts. We're kind of hanging out there for ourselves this morning or the, today. Uh, when the disciples, they get into trouble a lot, basically always for teaching about Jesus. And so this time, they were teaching about Jesus in the temple, and the religious leaders, the high council, they, they come and they, they find out this is happening, and they're getting a bit jealous. So they arrest them. They bring them before the high council, and they tell them to stop teaching about Jesus, essentially. And then they get thrown in jail, and as they're in jail uh, that night, this crazy thing happens. This angel comes and gets them out of jail without opening a single door. The guard stands there and the door's shut and never realizes anything leaves. They, they actually are told by the angel the next day to go and, and teach in the temple uh, the next day out in the open. So the high council meets again that day, that second day, and they uh, are like, okay, bring those guys for, uh, before us so we can kind of rule on them. And they send the guards, the guards go, and they say, oh, there's, there's not, no one there. The guard was there, the doors were locked, and they're still not there. What happened to them? And then they find out they're teaching in broad daylight at the temple. And as they teach, they go and they get arrested again peacefully because they don't want a mob. The high council doesn't want a mob. And they bring them before the council and they say, hey guys, you gotta stop teaching about Jesus. You're gonna get in trouble. And Peter, bold Peter, says this. He says, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. We must obey God rather than any human authority. I think that's being on God's team. I think that's being on God's team rather than your own team and wondering if God is for you or not. But saying that makes the high council furious. They really want to get rid of them now. They want to completely get them out of there and kill them. They're really frustrated by that answer, actually, because if anybody knows what's right and what's wrong in God's eyes, it's them. They're the high council. Except for this one particular person, um, Gamamiel. He stands up, and he begins to talk to these, this high council. He's actually really well-respected, this, this uh, religious leader of sorts that's really well-versed in the scriptures. And so he stands up and he says this. He says, Then he said to his colleagues, Men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Theudas, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed, and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So my advice is, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if this is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. That's a wise man. I don't think any of us want to find ourselves fighting against God. It's not a good decision. So, do you doubt whether God is on your side or not? Perhaps the better question isn't so much if God is on my side or not, it's Am I accepting the ways in which God is for me? For the fact that God is for me and loves me in spite of my circumstances and sin and mistakes. God is for me and and victory is literally ours through Jesus. He provides it. It's there for us. 
There's no power that can separate us from God. God gives us access to his power as we use it for him. We have access to God's forgiveness and his grace. We have access to him leading our lives, giving us direction on where to go and what decisions to make. We get to be these ambassadors and representatives and hands and feet for Jesus in this world. It's, it's our role, our responsibility, our privilege. This is who we get to be. It's how God is for us and works through us. It's how we we get to be on God's side, whether he's on our side or not. We get to be on God's side, and then, of course, we're part of his team and his family. And instead of asking if God is on our side, we can honestly and fully engage in making choices and actions as a people who are on God's side. This is not a Packers versus Vikings side, though that's fun and, and silly to play with. It's also not a Republican side or Democrat side. That's just exhausting. And it's definitely not a this church or that church side. This is a, this is a I'm following Jesus side. I am on Jesus' side, and, and that's how I'm going to live my life side. And that's how we can know that God is on our side because we're on his side. That's how we can live for God in that way and know that God is for us not just because he's coming after us with love and forgiveness and kindness, whether we're going after him or not, but when we are going after him, he can give us purpose and meaning and and value in this life, whether we face trials or not. So my question for you is this. How are you going to respond? How do you respond knowing that we have a choice of whether or not to be on God's side or not. How is it going to change your actions and reactions and your feelings and your desires? How is it going to shape those things? How is it going to affect your decisions? And and how are you going to not only decide whether whether or not you're on God's side, but how is it going to affect the, the way that you show it? Because people who show it, who show that they're a follower of Jesus with their life, they're like these lights in an often incredibly dark and cloudy world. They attract people because you can't help but be grateful for their generosity and kindness and goodness. So we can show it with our actions and we can be a person who is that light in this world. And, and honestly, there's this really simple step that we can take to begin to show it in an outward way. I think God knew that we'd need this physical action to begin showing our faith in him. And he gave us this gift of, of baptism to do that. And so in a couple of weeks, actually, we're going to be doing our baptism service out at Greenlight Conference Center. It's actually going to be happening in the morning within the service. It's going to be down by the lake. It's going to be phenomenal. I can't wait to be down there with you in a couple of weeks. But what we're going to do is have this opportunity to be baptized. And what that is, is this opportunity for you to say to yourself, before God, to your church family, and to everybody, that you have chosen to follow Jesus with your life. You're on God's side. You're on God's team. You're on, in God's family. And you want people to know. And it's this physical action that's holy, but it also isn't necessarily something that saves you, but it's something that demonstrates this, this faith that's within you. And so, I encourage you, if you're interested in that, if you want to make that public uh, choice, that public declaration with an action of being baptized, if you want to do that, I would love for you to send me an email um, at samprowitz at repentchurch.com, and and you can talk to me about that. And I would love to have that conversation. I would love even more to celebrate you taking that step of faith in a couple of weeks. With all of that said, I want to finish by saying this. We have a chance. We have an opportunity to react to this reality. We can not only live like God is for us, but we can live on God's side, on God's team, as a part of God's family. We can do that. We can be part of it. And so as you consider that, I encourage you to make that choice, to choose to live for God in that way, And also, if you have made that choice to show it, whether through baptism or your actions or the way you're living, any of those things, you can show it. And if you need the courage, I'll pray for the courage for you to take that step. And then finally, I'm going to ask for us to have the courage to be the kinds of lights that this world really needs. People that are living for Jesus, not on any of the other sides that are 
trying so desperately to get our support. So if you want those things, if you want to live for Jesus in that way, I want to ask you to say this prayer with me and and we'll pray together. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we are so incredibly grateful that you are for us. And sometimes we doubt if you're on our side and, and maybe for good reason. Maybe we've been doing things our way and just hoping you'll support it. But you have a different way for us. So God, I ask that we would be willing to embrace and engage your way, to find your truth and your words to us in the Bible and actually begin to live for you in that way. That we would make the bold choice of saying, I'm on God's team, I'm a part of God's family and I'm going to live like it and show it. And maybe you're praying with me right now and you want to have the courage to make the choice to get baptized and show it. And I pray that you would have that courage, that God would give you that courage to make that choice. And finally, God, in in a world that often feels a little dark, God, I ask that we would be these incredible lights who choose to be on Jesus' team and not any of the other many teams that are trying so hard to get our support, but that we would first and foremost and completely be people who live for your son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.